Hello and welcome to the Fit and Free podcast. This is a podcast for women who want it all, to feel strong and confident in their bodies, as well as enjoying a sneaky mug on a Friday night. I'm an exercise physiologist and sports nutritionist here to teach you how to achieve your body goals without food and your body controlling your life. So let's jump in. Hello, you guys, and welcome back to another episode of the Fit and Free podcast. This week has been a very overwhelming, to say the least. I don't know about you guys, if you can relate to this, or maybe you are you have your own business yourself, but I am definitely a type A person. I like to go at 100 miles per hour. And I absolutely need things to be a certain level of standard, which absolutely can really help me get things done. It can help me in terms of what I produce is a good standard. But then in turn, it also derails me. The overwhelm that I feel sometimes is sometimes crippling and I'm really learning how to sit in the uncomfortable instead of running away. This is a skill that I'm absolutely developing, learning how to sit in my overwhelm and learn how to slow down, get more organized and make better plans. But for someone who just jumps straight in, always, you know, the type of person that absolutely never reads instructions and is a doer, sure, I might get it done sometimes faster than a slowed down logical thinker. However, sometimes I have to do something three times in order to do it right. Instead of just slowing down, doing it right the first time and not getting so overwhelmed by it. (laughs) Today is the first day this week that I'm feeling actually so good. I'm feeling really motivated again. I'm feeling really inspired and I'm feeling really, really just like really good of what's coming. If you asked me that yesterday, I would have broken down into tears because I was like, I don't know how I'm going to get all this done. I don't know how I'm even going to continue like this. And like I was down in a hole. Something that has really helped me with this is number one, starting my morning routine again. For a few weeks, I absolutely, I stopped doing it. I stopped doing my morning journaling. I stopped doing my subconscious reprogramming track. I stopped dancing in the shower and I definitely felt a shift in my own mental health. Oh, the other thing I stopped as well, sorry, is my morning walk. And it's so crazy how much that has impacted me and how I'm feeling. So by slowing down, I've been able to reflect on what's missing. And now I'm taking radical responsibility in terms of changing it because I could absolutely continue to stay with this overwhelm and I could absolutely stay in this high stressful state but of course that is I'm not going to get anywhere with that because it's absolutely not sustainable so I've intentionally started doing my morning routine again and following the steps of getting up and going for a walk with my coffee then going to the gym, going to train, and then going to my favorite coffee shop with my journal so I can slow down and reflect on how I'm feeling. Because the thing is, is that when you get caught up in the noise, and I like to call it noise because that's what it is. It's literally the stories that we are telling ourselves over and over again, and we're making it believe that it's true. When in reality, when you're able to get out of the noise, out of your head and back into your body, you can actually realize a lot of the stuff that you're telling yourself is actually not true. For example, getting super overwhelmed with, you know, content creation and how much I have to produce and all of these things and making myself believe that it's not achievable and that I can't do it. However, 
after I, you know, slowed down and made a plan, I was like, oh, I absolutely can do it. I just needed those steps in place. But if I never slowed down to speed up and continued in the noise and stayed within my head, then I never would have come to that conclusion. So that is my lesson of this week. Next week, I'm really excited. I'm going to record a podcast episode about last weekend. I had one of the worst body image days I've had in such a long time. And I'm going to tell you like the backstory and the context of it and then like really how I'm moving through that. So I'm super excited. But there was another topic that I first wanted to talk about. And that is exercise. And I was thinking I could sit here and tell you like tips and tricks on, you know, how to cultivate and build a really healthy relationship with exercise. Or I thought to myself, I'm actually going to share my story today on my unhealthy relationship with exercise. Because when I was in it, I absolutely didn't think that I had a problem with my exercise. I used exercise to manage my mental health. It was the thing that made me feel good, that made me feel healthy. However, what I didn't realize is that I actually developed an exercise addiction because I was using it as a coping mechanism to make myself feel good. I was using it to run away from my problems. I was using it to numb the pain of feeling my emotions, as well as there was a lot of body image tied to it in terms of guilt and shame if I missed an exercise session or if I had a rest day. So now you, I can see clearly that there was absolutely a problem with my exercise. So I want to tell you the story of how that kind of developed. And then I really want to share some signs and symptoms to look out for and just to reflect on your own exercise routine to see if it is a really healthy relationship with exercise or if you're using it in the same way that I used to in terms of, you know, finding that happiness and making us feel good enough about ourselves. And then I'm going to share some tips that really helped me rebuild a really healthy relationship with exercise. So what I want to start with is like, what even is exercise? Like, what the hell is it? (laughs) Because the thing is, exercise can actually be broken down into two different categories. And these categories are what makes up our total daily energy expenditure. So what that means is like how much energy a person is burning in a day. And we know that comes from our basal metabolic rate. It comes from the thermic effect of food. And then it also comes down to our movement. And this is where our movement can be broken up into two categories. The first category is our non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So what that is, is our NEAT. And what that is, is our incidental activity. So that's literally everything from, you know, getting up and moving around to getting out of the car and walking into work. That is fidgeting. That is you know, using your hands when you're doing a presentation. All of our incidental movement that we complete throughout the day. The second, of course, is our EAT, which is our exercise activity thermogenesis. So all that means is that that is our planned exercise into our routine. So that is like going for a planned run, going to do a Pilates class, going to do a gym session. And the reason why I wanted to give you these definitions is because I'm actually going to be talking about both of these things in today's podcast in terms of like signs and symptoms with a healthy relationship with exercise. 
because it's not just the planned sessions that we intentionally, you know, try and change around, but it's also our NEAT as well. So really important just to set that definition for you guys. And it's crazy, right? Because we live in a world where we're made to believe that the more exercise, the better. Like even on my gym wall, it says no pain, no gain, right? <laughs> and absolutely, exercise is so, so important for so many different reasons. I studied it for four years at university. The effects of exercise in so many different conditions can be absolutely transformational. Things from, you know, heart disease, things from cancer, things to osteoporosis. If exercise, I say this all the time, was like the benefits of exercise to be able to be put into a pill, it should be prescribed to everyone in terms of increasing our heart size from being able to pump more blood in and around the body so that we can move oxygen throughout our body, which gives us, you know, more energy from impacting our bone health to making our bones literally stronger to making our muscles stronger so that we can, you know, lift up the kids so that we can do epic things when we go on holidays, when we can just feel really strong and empowered. Like I freaking love exercise. Can you tell? However, it's not often spoken about when people take this quote unquote healthy thing too far. Because it's not often spoke about the guilt that people feel when they don't get to exercise. When people are avoiding a social situation because they haven't been to the gym yet. When people are, you know, going out for an amazing dinner and cocktails, but then the next day they have to punish themselves by going and doing extra exercise. This is something that more people need to be talking about because it absolutely is a problem and I see it all the time. Going back to that conditioning of more is better, right? I have to go for a run today. I have to go to the gym today. I have to go do a Pilates session in a day, all in one day because we're made to believe that is healthy. We are made to believe that more is better. When in reality, one exercise session a day and varied intensities and types across the week and then having rest days is a healthy level of exercise. I do have to say here that for some people, training twice a day is absolutely necessary. Absolutely. If you're like an elite athlete, for example, because for an elite athlete, let's take a rugby league player, for example. A rugby league player absolutely needs to do different types of training in order to be their best during the game. What I mean by that, they absolutely need to be doing strength training, muscle hypertrophy training to making sure they've got enough muscles so they're strong enough to withhold those hits. They need to be doing power training because, you know, they're sprinting for those 10 meters. They need to be quick. They need to be fast. So they need to be training for that. They need skill-based training. They need to be doing agility training. They need to be, you know, being able to move their feet and change directions really quickly. They need to be doing endurance training because they are, you know, they're spending an hour in a football game, right? So, For someone like that, because they need to be training so many different elements, then absolutely these sort of people will be training twice a day. (laughs) The thing is, is that when they're training across the week, and this is one of the biggest mistakes I see people make, is that when you look at a rugby league's player's, you know, training schedule, what they've paired on the same day complements their training. So what I mean by that, for example, is they might do a heavy strength training session in the morning, 
And then in the afternoon, it might be like a lighter skill-based throwing the ball session. What you'll see is they will never be pairing two really intense sessions close to each other. Instead, they will spread out the intensity of their training. And that's one of the biggest mistakes that I see people make in like just us in gen pop is that, you know, they're going to go for a 20k kilometer run and then the next day or maybe sometimes even the same day, they'll go in and try and do a heavy hypertrophy leg training session and expect a really good result. When in reality, number one, we're not conditioned to that sort of training because like, we're not professional athletes who have the capacity to train twice a day because that's literally what they're paid for. We have to work full time. You know, we have to get to hang out with our friends. We get to, you know, live our best lives. <laughs> and I honestly believe it comes back to that conditioning of the fact that we need to do more. We need to do more in order to reach our goals. When in reality, you actually just need a really solid plan in order for you to achieve them. So I want to start off with telling you guys a little bit of backstory about kind of how I developed this really unhealthy relationship with exercise. So it all started back when I was, you know, in primary school, transitioning to high school. I've always been a sporty kid. I was always, you know, playing soccer with the boys, playing footy with the boys. I was you know, that tomboy, quote unquote. And that continued and that developed over into high school where then I, you know, I started playing hockey, I started swimming, I started playing netball. And for someone who has really poor fine motor skills, like I'm really bad with my hands. However, I'm really coordinated when it comes to sport. So I always excelled in sport and I think that's one of the biggest reasons why I actually really enjoyed it because I naturally just was able to pick it up really quick and then of course you get that external validation being like oh Laura you're so good oh Laura you're so good at netball you're so good at goalkeeper you're so good at goal defense so of course You've got that feedback loop. So then you're like, cool, I want to keep doing that. I'm enjoying this because I'm good at it. Like, this is fun. And I look back on it now and I'm like, holy crap, that was so ego. That was so ego. I was getting so much validation from being good at something. So that was like one of my main drivers. Anyway, I am grateful for the sporty background because I probably wouldn't be sitting here recording this podcast for that. And that continued, right? Like I was always into like PE. I was always into, you know, health subjects. This is where I really started to create, tie my identity to being the fit one. Because that's where I was getting all that external validation. And that's where I was creating this version of me was, oh, I felt good enough if I was good at sport. So therefore I'm worthy. I'm good. And I like to reflect on that now because obviously at the time I had, no freaking idea that that's what I was doing. So moving from secondary school into high school, this is where I found the gym. And during this time moving into university was actually when I gave up all my sport. I stopped playing everything. And during this time, upon reflecting on like creating this podcast episode is I really figured out that I absolutely, there was a part of me that I lost. I lost that quote unquote fit identity because I no longer was feeling good because I was constantly being told that I was good at something through sport. So this is when I actually replaced that feeling with partying because when I partied was when I started getting that validation So for the first couple of years at uni, living on student accommodation, like partying three times a week was like some of the best years of my life. Freaking loved living on student accommodation. Um, Still got some of my best friends from there today, as well as Niels, my partner. I met him there and it was our nine year anniversary like three days ago. So go figure. But anyway, um, during this time, during this partying stage is when I, like I said, is when I found the gym. 
And I actually am really grateful that I did find that because this is where I was able to, you know, start exercising, I guess, in quote unquote, like kind of more of so of a healthy way. I definitely still, there was a part of me that was still looking for that sense of validation, that sense of worth, because I still wanted to be the best. I still wanted to be, you know, lifting the heaviest. I still wanted people to notice me. I still wanted to be that fit one. After uni, I kind of like still went to the gym. I still, you know, I dabbled with it in terms of like I was doing exercise programs. I started doing like Les Meals workouts. I started doing, you know, all the things that you do when you go to like a good life gym. And I really started noticing how it made me feel. This is when I was like, oh, exercise really does make me feel good. Like, stop drinking so much and really started paying attention to like literally the benefits that I was getting from a regular exercise routine that wasn't necessarily sport. That was more so in the gym. So I would train and then I'd get these endorphins and you just get that exercise high and just feel like so freaking good. So I was, you know, after creating this regular routine is when I really started adding more exercise into my routine. A negative thing here that happened was I started, you know, feeling worthy again because I was starting to get that identity back of being the fit one. Because with this regular exercise routine is my body started changing in terms of in quote unquote like a positive way that I wanted it to. I started looking fitter. I started dropping like all the puffiness and the all the like the excess body weight that I had accumulated through drinking. As time went on, I, you know, I dabbled with different types of exercise after I did my own thing at the gym and Les Mills. I then like went to group fitness classes. I went to CrossFit gyms. I went to different types of like, you know, just your stock standard gyms. And this is when I really, really started to notice my body. And then when I started like in these group fitness classes and like in the CrossFit gym, this is where the exercise switched for me, where it more so became completely about body aesthetics rather than the exercise itself and how it made me feel. However, I was still on the bandwagon of like, I'm just doing this because of the way it makes me feel. However, What I was actually doing is I started doing it because I hated my body and I hated what I looked like. Constant challenges in the gym so that I could lose body fat. Constant crazy exercise sessions so that I could burn lots of calories. Crazy restrictive diets that go with these crazy exercise routines in order for my body to look a certain way. And this is when I started adding in more on top of that. This is when I started going for a run at like 5 a.m. to then go to work, to work for 12 hours. And then in the hour in between my work is when I would do my strength training session. Or on a Friday, I would do an exercise session in the morning and then I would work all day. And then I would have another shift at a different job in the afternoon Before that job, I would throw in a hit session. This is when I took the exercise feel good feeling too far because this is when I started developing guilt when I didn't exercise. This is when I started leaving social situations early because I hadn't been to the gym. I remember one day I went out for margaritas with some of my besties And I had two margaritas and then I said to them all, I had to leave because I don't know what the excuse was. I can't remember what it was, but the thing was, is that it's because I had to go to the gym. So what did I do? I drove home, put my gym clothes on after those two margaritas and went and trained. This is when I started to add in extra exercise when I ate too much. This is when I started compensating, you know, eating sweets with exercise. For example, I remember 
clients bringing in like baked goods to work and then I would have one and then I would feel the instant need to get on the exercise bike and start exercising. Still saying to me, myself and to everyone around me, don't have a problem with my exercise. I'm using it to manage my mental health. But was I really using it to manage my mental health? Or really was I using it to fill a void and quote unquote, actually make it worse? Because the guilt that I was feeling, the anxiousness, the shame that I had when I wasn't able to exercise was absolutely not healthy. The other thing that really made all of this worse for me and it was because of my holding on to that identity of being the fit one. Because when I was doing all this extreme exercise, doing these exercises, I got confirmation bias of that it was a good thing from all my loved ones. Oh, she's so healthy. She's so inspiring. She's so disciplined. When in reality, I was literally burning myself to the ground without myself or really anyone really noticing around me. And the crazy thing was, is that I thought I had to do all of these things in order to see results because I was seeing truth in that, right? Because I would drop body fat from all the hit and all the restrictive challenges that I was doing. But the thing was, was that restriction being all in was the only way that I ever saw a result. So that that made me believe that that's what exactly I had to do in order to achieve what I really wanted. I didn't know there was another way. And it's crazy to look back on now because at the same time that, you know, I was doing all of this, there was so many red flags that I didn't even realize. For example, I wasn't progressing with my strength training. As in, I wasn't actually getting stronger each week. And that's hard in a group fitness environment anyway, because you're never really doing the same thing. So you don't really have that opportunity to get better. However, after following a program now for the last, you know, two years and the amount that I've progressed in that, I was like, well, okay, I was absolutely not getting stronger within these fast paced group fitness classes my back would constantly spasm. Like I was constantly getting back pain and I would always get so frustrated because I was like, oh my God, why does this keep happening to me? I don't get it. My hip pain became so unbearable. And the thing was, is that my body composition wasn't changing in the way that I wanted it to. For so long, I wanted to get lean and toned and have like a fit girl physique, but... It was never happening because I wasn't eating enough and I had an unhealthy relationship with exercise and I was training too much and I wasn't recovering. When I hit rock bottom, I remember looking at myself in the mirror and I was like, things has got to change. This is not okay. When I came to the realization that I did have to change, my exercise routine was the hardest thing to give up. I got on board pretty quick with like eating more because it definitely was under eating. But I was like, absolutely not. I'm not stopping exercise. I'm not. I'm not giving up the gym. I'm not. I remember saying that to my coach. And the thing was, is because there was so much, so much stuff going on deeper than it was just giving up exercise because it was giving up my identity. It was giving up the thing that made me feel good about myself it was giving up you know that validation from other people to make myself feel worthy and I was absolutely terrified of my body changing especially in partnering with eating more because if my body didn't look a certain way then I absolutely wouldn't feel good enough slowly slowly after time Working with a coach, I absolutely could not have done this alone because the emotional roller coaster that this was, it was hard. It absolutely was. 
So slowly, slowly after time, I did reduce the amount of exercise that I was doing. I did eventually cancel my gym membership, but that was because I had hypothalamic amenorrhea. I didn't have a period. What I know now is I probably wouldn't have done that. I definitely would have, you know, just completely changed the volume and the intensity of my training, but I didn't know that then. I was impressionable. I was like, oh my God, oh me. (laughs) Anyway, so I canceled my gym membership and I bought a bike. I love my bike so much. As soon as I go back to Australia, I'm going to get my bike. Um, And then I really replaced all of like intense exercise, any hit, any going for runs with gentle movement. So things like riding my bike, things like going for really nice walks, things like some mobility stuff at home. The biggest thing throughout this journey was I had to learn how to exercise from a place of self-love rather than a place of self-hate. Because the thing is, is that you're never going to achieve a body that you love if it's coming from a place of hate. And I tell you this if you're struggling with it, if you're constantly trying to change your body with your exercise or if you're trying to work off your food, then this is never going to work for you. Because even when you achieve that quote unquote like goal weight or that, you know, centimeters around your stomach or if you hit that size eight or six or whatever the size that you're aiming for is that that's not going to give you happiness. I had to learn that the hard way because the size of your body is never going to be able to give you a sense of self-worth. You may think that now. You may think that if I lose five kilos, I'll all of a sudden be more confident. Or if I'm a certain size, I'm going to be more confident. It doesn't work like that. What works is learning to love yourself from the inside out. Developing your self-worth away from any sort of external validation. Being able to validate yourself is the way that you're going to feel happy in your body. And that comes down to so many different factors in terms of it comes from self-acceptance. It comes from knowing your values. It comes from speaking your truth. It comes from being yourself unapologetically. And that is something that you absolutely can't learn or you can't achieve by losing five kilos. So... Ladies, if you're struggling with this, I freaking see you so hard because it's absolutely so challenging to be able to move through it. Number one, recognizing that you have an issue. And number two, learning how to reduce the amount of exercise that you are doing is terrifying. What if my body does this? What if I gain weight? What if this happens? I fully hear you and I fully see you. So... Ladies, I want to explain some signs and symptoms. I want to go through a few more that are really common with an unhealthy relationship with exercise. The first one is over-reliant on the mood-boosting effects of exercise. So if you are, you know, you're feeling emotional, you're feeling angry, you're feeling frustrated, you're feeling stress, and the first thing that you always want to do is go and exercise even though you're feeling fatigued, you're feeling flat out at work. The second is fixation on missing a session. Like it kind of, it's that day ruining feeling of, oh, oh my God, I can't exercise. What am I going to do? Oh my God, I'm going to gain weight. Or, oh my God, I have to make up for this somewhere else. The next one is not able to take a rest day because you feel too guilty of what's going to happen if you don't. The next one is compulsive exercise. So signs of that is, you know, you're worried about what's going to happen. You're really focusing on burning enough calories so that, you know, your body changes in a positive way. Or you maybe you have a sore back, but you're going to go to the gym anyway because you can't miss the session. And the last one is exercise rigidity. So you have to do a certain amount. You have to do it for a certain amount of time. You have to do it at a certain amount of intensity and if you can't train hard enough, if you can't train at that certain intensity, if you can't beat the week before, then it really makes you feel irritated and annoyed. So 
I definitely was struggling with a lot of those and I know so many people are as well. So now I want to explain some tips that really did help me through it. So the first tip that really helped me was just acknowledging the fact that I wasn't managing my mental health through my exercise. What I was doing was absolutely making it worse. If I was frustrated, I would do hit. If I was stressed, I would do hit. If I was sad, I would do hit. Because what I was trying to do was avoid those emotions and I was looking for that dopamine release to make myself feel good. But the thing is, is that with HIT, what you're doing is you have to remember that exercise is a form of stress on the body and it's actually increasing your cortisol levels. So think about it. Like if you're already freaking stressed from work, then you go and do this freaking high intensity exercise session. Your cortisol levels is going to be through the roof. And we know that stress can be just as damaging on the body as what like drinking alcohol can be. So first tip is acknowledging the fact that you're struggling, that you're not using exercise from an empowered place, but you're absolutely using it as a tool to avoid those emotions. And that perfectly moves into my second tip is that we have to learn how to deal with our emotions. (laughs) And oh my God, I was a wall up individual that I was a cold bitch that really was, didn't let anyone into my heart. And this is something I'm still, honestly, I'm still working on this, but being able to learn how to manage emotions and learn how to deal with them in a healthy way is so important. Increasing our coping skills. So for me, what really helped me was being able to sit with the emotion and name it. Like, what am I actually feeling? Am I feeling anger? Am I feeling stress? Am I sitting in overwhelm? And then the next thing I do is I come in with curiosity and compassion towards myself. Why am I feeling like this? What is going on right now? Let me sit in this really uncomfortable feeling and really sit with those emotions. Then journaling, of course, I always talk about journaling in terms of being able to sit down, slow down and really reflect on why I'm feeling like that and being able to put it on pen and paper is so powerful because you can really understand like, what am I, why am I feeling like this? Where is this coming from? And a lot of the time it's coming from a lot deeper than just feeling angry. (laughs) And then lastly is I am an angry person. I'm not going to lie to you guys. Like, I don't know. It's just hardwired into me. So I had to learn how to deal with my anger. So anger releasing, yelling into a pillow, punching a pillow, you know, really trying to learn how to deal with that anger. The next thing that really helped me was education. So really learning on actually how to achieve your dream physique, how actually to build muscle, how actually to get fitter. Because the thing was, is that it was so hardwired into me that more is better, more is better. I need to burn more calories. I need to do this, this, this. Then in reality, my goal was to get toned, aka, I hate the word toned, but anyway, build lean muscle and drop fat tissue. And what I was doing with my exercise routine was not that. (laughs) I was trying to make myself smaller, reduce my body fat and not even work my muscles hard enough to give them a reason to change. So I had to learn. Okay, cool. I know I have to build muscle. Sweet. How do I build muscle? Hypertrophy training. Oh, what else do you need to build muscle? Oh, you need to recover because if you're not recovering, your muscles aren't going to grow. You've got to think about it like a Lego block. You need to build, build, build it up and let it, you know, create structure and integrity. But if you're not allowing the building blocks to be laid down each time, aka your recovery, then your body ain't going to change. So it's just revisiting that whole exercise volume conversation on how much volume do you actually need to get enough stimulus through your muscles. And that's this whole big thing about education, right? Like all you need is you need to be training each muscle group twice a week and you need to be doing about 10 sets in order for it to change. 
So that means you don't need to be doing a strength training session, a Pilates session, and then maybe going for a walk all in one day to get definition in your core. What you need to be doing if you want definition in your core is you need to be training the core muscles twice a week, hitting that 10 sets, and then of course applying progressive overload. So doing a little bit more each and every week. The next thing that really helped me, my next tip was leaning in to things that felt really uncomfortable for me. So leaning in to the reduction of exercise, leaning in to the fear, leaning in and sitting through the discomfort. Then through my own experience, building trust that this process will actually work. Leaning in to the fact that I had more energy, that I actually started lifting heavier, that I actually started seeing my body composition change, really started focusing on all the positive aspects of what was happening when I did decrease that exercise. Other things as well, away from body composition, things like my social life improved because now I was so present and was able to enjoy the situation rather than thinking about the exercise that I hadn't done yet. Things like going out and eating with my friends and being there and enjoying it. And then the next day, go out for a croissant and enjoy myself rather than the thought of having to go and punish myself with more exercise. But the only way really, really is to do it and then build trust in the fact that that can absolutely be your new story. And it's really important along this journey is to pull out your wins. Start celebrating the small stuff because it's that small stuff is the way to build self-trust so that you can continue with your new actions. So things like celebrating the fact that you lift, you know, that two and a half kilos heavier. Celebrate the fact that you went out for cocktails guilt fucking free and then you didn't have to make up for it the next day. Celebrate the fact that you've got so much freaking energy and you feel so freaking good. This is the stuff that is going to be able to keep you going and keep you motivated because there's going to be a lot of struggles along the way. There's going to be a day that you're absolutely triggered by your bad body image and then you feel like nothing is working and you feel like you want to throw it all out the window and go for a run. It's in those specific moments that you need to be able to reflect on all the good things that are actually happening in your life so that you can continue with all the things in terms of the right exercise dosage, right amount of fuel that is actually going to lead you to your result. The next tip I have for you guys is going back. It's not necessarily anything physical, but this is a mental shift that helped me so much. And this is all about learning who I was away from exercise. And that's why I told you all of that in the story of linking my own identity to exercise and being good. And that was the way I was getting external validation. I had to replace that. I had to learn who the hell I was and I had to learn how to, number one, be her without any sugarcoating, any people pleasing or anything like that. And I had to learn who I truly was and shift my identity. So the ways that I did that was absolutely, first of all, is through self-acceptance. Because there's a difference between accepting yourself and there's a difference between, you know, you see on social media, oh my God, love yourself, love your body. Like, oh my God, self-love. Like, I am a realist and I believe that you're not going to love everything about your body. Absolutely not. However, There is a difference between that sort of self-love and there's a difference between self-acceptance because at the end of the day is like you can't change your genetics. You absolutely can't. And there's no point of constantly fighting against how you're genetically made. For me personally, like now, I still don't love my stomach and I'm not afraid to say that, but I don't hate it. 
because I have come to a place of self-acceptance because this is who I am and this is my body and this is what my body can do for me. And that was a really big thing in this whole self-acceptance journey for me was really appreciating what my body can do for me and being freaking grateful for the fact that I can do what I can do. The other thing that helped me with this self-acceptance journey was understanding that I'm not going to be good at everything. And the thing is, like, that is absolutely okay. Because for so long I was like, well, I'm shit at that, I'm not going to do it. Or I'm embarrassed because I look a certain way because I'm not good at it. And then, of course, what was I doing? I was making that mean that I wasn't good enough because I wasn't good at something. But instead now I'm able to be like, hang on a minute, this is me, this is who I am. I am good at things, but I'm also terrible at things and that is normal and that is okay. That doesn't make me any lesser of a person, doesn't make me any lesser good enough. It doesn't mean anything about me. This means I'm shit at spelling and that's me. You've probably seen it on my Instagram stories. But I think absolutely working on Figuring out who you are away from what you look like and cultivating self-acceptance and also learning about your values and your morals and what how you truly want to live and lead your life is really important in healing your relationship with exercise. And then the last tip that I have for you guys is just playing around with that intensity across your week. So making sure that not every single exercise session is like absolutely destroying your soul. Because the fact is, you absolutely don't need to do that in order to see results. It's actually hindering your progress if you're constantly working, you know, 10 out of 10, working till failure, destroying yourself with cardio, lifting super heavy, is that's so taxing on the body, on our joints, on our ligaments, on our nervous system. It really just put so much stress on the body and let's say unnecessary stress on the body because, again, going back the whole conditioning of this world of more is better. So, my lovely people, that is it. That is the story of my exercise addiction, how I overcame it, and some real practical, helpful tips for you guys that really can help you through it if you are struggling with it. Don't forget the next intake of the Fit and Free Academy is open and the Fit and Free Academy is absolutely going to help you with an unhealthy relationship with exercise. It is absolutely going to set you up with structure, a plan so that you can absolutely achieve your goals so you know exactly what type of exercise you need to do how much you need to do a week, as well as without feeling like you're burning yourself to the ground. It's also going to help you with the guilt. It's going to help you with any shame that you might be feeling in and around it because we're going to set you up with a plan that actually freaking works for you. If you want more information, I do have a link down in the description box. So head there, click on that. If you want more information, I do have a link to the website, which is the link is in the description box below. So go click on it, have a read. And with that all being said, you know, I appreciate you guys so much and always thank you guys for listening and I will see you in the next episode.